Um, hi everyone, this is Kelsey Hoffman from Quirk Books. I'm joined today by Robert Rapino, the author of Spark and the League of Ursus, the first in a middle grade fantasy duology, as well as author Tanya Del Rio and illustrator Will Staley, the creators of the War in the 13th series, including the final installment, War in the 13th and the 13 Year Curse. Thank you all so much for joining me here today. Um, so before I turn the conversation over to the three of you, why don't you each tell me, uh, tell us all a little bit about your books. All right. Robert, you wanna I go? I guess, <laughs> okay, all right, I'll go for it. All right, um, I do have a copy. I think all you right. asked us to have, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yes, okay. beautiful. Um, so my book is uh, Spark in the League of Ursus, and uh, it is about, I th we've, been, we've been saying it's, it's Toy Story meets Stranger Things. So it's, um, it's about a league of teddy bears that protects children from monsters. And please forgive me, I'm in New York and we have uh, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. I'm right by the hospital, sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there is a, there's a teddy bear named Spark who protects her human friend named Loretta. And uh, instead of it just being the normal monsters under your bed, it turns out to be uh, a much more dangerous monster that's stealing children. And uh, Spark has to rally her her friends, sort of like the Dirty Dozen or, or the Avengers. Sorry, Dirty Dozen's too old of a, of a reference. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, maybe let's say the Avengers, but you know, she has to get the crew together for one last job. So uh, to fight this monster. So that's what mine's about. Cool. Cool. Um, um, we'll Tanya, you want to go ahead on sure. the more? Sure. Um, so here it is, the third book in our series, War in the 13th and the 13 Year Curse. And it completes the trilogy. And it's basically about a sort of cursed Victorian bellhop who manages his family's ancient hotel. And throughout the course of the series, you know, he starts off as a really lonely boy who pretty much is struggling to keep the hotel afloat. Um, but then over the course of the series, he discovers some secrets about the hotel that sort of unlock new adventures and he starts making new friends and some enemies along the way. And it's hard to say too much about it without giving it away, but basically in the third book, um, his best friend, uh, Sketchy, who is a sort of but non-binary cephalopod um, gets kidnapped and Warren must solve a series of clues and face off against pirates and sea circus clowns to save his pet. So, anything slash to add? Slash friend. Yeah, slash pet friend. slash friend. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's it. Pets are friends. That's, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah that sums it up, I think. Yeah, all right. Oh, so, um, Wait, was Will going to introduce himself? So, or yeah. I, I feel like you're both uh, of this. <laughs> you're you're the two-headed monster of this book. So. <laughs> we are, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think Tanya did a great job explaining kind of the, the premise of Warren. I, I am, I am, you know, part of the creative team and uh, obviously the illustrator and designer of the the series. And it's been a, it's been a super fun run, and we're really happy to have the series, you know, complete at this point. So. Yeah, that is, it's, I mean, completing a series in five years sounds uh, like a lot of work. Uh, yeah, I am not on yeah. that same schedule for other things. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but especially, yeah, especially with how kind of ornate and involved the layout and stuff is in, in the Warren books, obviously, is, uh, you know, adds a little bit of time to the schedule, but it's, uh, but it's well, worth the, well worth the effort, so. But Do you also, I'm really excited to, sorry, sorry. No, you go, you go, please. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I was just really excited. To, <laughs> I was excited to hear that um, Spark will be a duology. Is that what I heard? A duology, at least All to right. start with. There may be All more. All right. I'm but, excited because uh, I was, I wanted more when I read yeah, it. Yeah, so. there will be more. And in fact, that's why th this month has been so crazy because that manuscript is due, um, I think, by the end of this month. Although <laughs> I'm already contemplating some kind of sob story about how oh, well, I just need a few more days. Uh, so it's, it's been a long process. It's happening. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I'm, I, I'm chipping away. Yeah. I'm curious. How is, how is your writing process going during this crazy quarantine? Is it affecting your creativity at all? Um, it's definitely affecting my energy. Uh, luckily I had this mapped out. I had this, I, this is probably the most planned out I've ever had of a book before. Um, and I was going to, I was going to eventually get into nuts and bolts asking you guys how you, how you plan things out. But I, this was probably beca because the sequel involved like a very detailed explanation for the publisher about what we we're going to do. I actually, you know, wrote like a three page, very detailed, I, I guess you'd call it a treatment. I don't know what term 
they use. But uh, I've been following that, uh, which has been very, very helpful. But, you know, I've made the mistake before of just saying, oh, I have an idea. Let's start writing a novel. And uh, yeah. it, it has not gone well. <laughs> uh, are, are you a detailed outline guy generally? Is that kind of your process? I'm becoming more of one. Okay. Uh, I think with each book, with each passing book, I, uh, I, my outline gets more and more detailed to the point where it's, it's down to every, at least every single chapter will have like a list of things that have to happen. Sure. Um, I think that's, that's how I've ended up. That's the direction I've ended up going in. And, and it's from learning the hard way. You know, there, there's an amazing video on YouTube of Ray Bradbury. Uh, it's from like 2001 and talking, just giving a speech on, on um, writing stories. And he's like, if you want to write, you want to get better at writing, just commit to writing shorter pieces for a given period of time, a year or whatever. The mistake too many people make, and a mistake I made for several failed novels that will never see the light of day, is I was trying to get better as a writer by writing a novel, which is a terrible idea. It would be like <laughs> trying to get better at basketball by playing Michael Jordan one-on-one. -on -one. You're just going to be demoralized and you're not going to learn anything. Yeah. And uh, so just write shorter pieces to start with and then that's that's the advice I end up giving everybody, and and yes, I learned I learned the hard way. I don't know if you have similar experiences you can share, and we can lament. <laughs> well, I mean, at least for me, I I start out in comics, which I guess is a shorter form of writing. So I did sort of uh, do a lot of comic book scripts leading up to writing my first novel. Um, so I think there is truth in that, like just writing shorter stuff to kind of tone, you know, t dial in your abilities to tell a story. And uh, I think Warren is kind of cool in that it's so visual. So it's kind of like a comic in a, in a way, because there's actually are some comic panels in this, in this book that we came up with. But um, yeah, so I, I would agree with that for sure. Yeah. Um, I have to ask more nuts and bolts things. I, I, I'm obsessed with this. So what did the first manuscript look like and how, how much, if, if, as much as you're willing to say, how much did it change? Because mine's mine always changed so drastically. It's mm -hmm. it's embarrassing. I don't even want to, but I don't know if I don't know if this if this is too sensitive a topic. No, no, I no. Really understand. I mean, Will actually created the character in art school. We went to art school together many years ago, and okay. and he created it for a comic class, right? Comic book class, or was it poster yeah, making? I, yeah, I mean, I think the the idea just kind of came to me, and then I and then I think I did it kind of executed in a like a short form comic at one point. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then I was. Uh, asking if I could work on like a story based on his character. And since we collaborated a lot in creative things at that time, and I wrote a draft, or at least almost completed a draft of an early novel based on Warren. And we tinkered with it like literally over a decade before we ever pitched it to Quirk. And by the time we created the book for the, for the series, it completely changed. I, I would say maybe 5% of the original story was left. Wow, him. that's that's inspiring because I think there are too many people out there who don't understand how much revision plays a role. And like revision is the writing. Yeah, that's that is sure. the writing it's, part. I think it's the hardest part actually. Um, yeah, the outlining and like getting the story in place before you actually start writing. That's really hard. I yeah. think. Yeah. Did you? I and think, what, oh, go ahead, Will. I'm sorry. No, no, go, go ahead, Robert. Go ahead. It's fine. I was just gonna say. Um, I was actually moving on to another question, so maybe you should say your point so I don't uh, derail well, what you're about to say. <laughs> yeah. I was going to just say, I think some, something to do with the actual time period actually helped too. I think that that 10 years of having that on the shelf sort of allowed us to kind of start fresh when we pitched the, the, the book to Quirk, basically. So, um, so we took some elements of that, but it really was kind of a new pitch that we brought to Quirk. Um, so yeah, so that, was, that helped as well, I think. But, yeah. and it's, it sounds like there was like a long gap between like having the first like image in your head and actually mm -hmm. saying, I have a book. Is that, okay, yeah. yeah. I think it was about, I think we actually did the math at one point and it basically was pretty much 13 years, which is hilarious because it's more than the 13th. <laughs> and so it's a, it's there's some kind of a, some kind of magic number there, but yeah. Yeah, wow, okay, yeah. I'm usually, I'm, I think for me, it's usually a few months, at least a few months before, I, like I have a vision in my head, but then I'll have to think about it for a long time and keep asking myself, do you really, do you really want to do this to yourself? <laughs> yeah. that's how I you feel about tattoos you know I get a tattoo idea and I have to live with it for most of my life so I have to think about it for like six months before I commit to it yes that's the way to do it that's the way to do it um um oh, what was I gonna say ah well, I have a oh question uh, and how much what's oh, that no I was gonna oh. say I had a question for you if you're if you're, if you're oh wait I just have one more one more and okay. then I mean, yeah, yeah. before we move how much did Warren change because the image of Warren is so cool and i know you guys collaborate a lot because i've done some 
some, some reading. I, I watched some in YouTube interviews and stuff where I wanted to learn a little bit more about you before this. And I know yeah. you guys uh, collaborate a lot. Like, how much did the image of Warren change? Because he looks so cool. He's pretty much as designed initially, I think. Right, Tanya? I mean, yeah, outside I of... I think he's probably the one thing that hasn't changed this whole process. Yeah. And his yeah. personality, too. His sort of hardworking, earnest, um, mm -hmm. good, good, good guy kind of attitude. Yeah. You know, I think that's been consistent throughout. Yeah, yeah, he's always looked. He always looked the way he does, and he's always been a bellhop. Basically, that was the first drawing I did of him. Was you know him with a little bellhop cap, and and so that was always kind of the core character layout, you know, design. But um, the engraving kind of style came a little later on, I feel like. But um, yeah, but yeah. Did yeah. did either of you have jobs in this in hotel work? <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of respect and reverence for it that's why i had to ask and I, I i mean that that's, that's as a compliment like there was a lot of yeah. respect maybe in yeah. a past life i don't maybe know yeah, yeah. you so tiny your dad had some work he worked he worked for that's hotel true my dad my life. dad worked in the hotel business but more of a, an executive computer <laughs> tech yeah. support kind of way but um yeah. yeah i guess you know maybe that influenced me i don't know okay <laughs> okay uh, but yeah. I want to ask you, Robert, because I, like I said, I'm a big fan of teddy bears. I actually brought my teddy bear that I had since I was like eight years old. This is Pads. <laughs> oh, what's his name? Pads? Pads. Because I love Pads. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Okay. And so um, I was curious, like, if your story, like, what inspired you to write that? Do you, do you, did you have teddy bears growing up or do you still have teddy bears? How can you I, I don't have teddy bears now and I'm sad about that. And I've gone looking for the ones I grew up with and I don't know where they are. Uh -huh. I, I feel it's like a piece of me that's lost somehow. Uh, but I did have them growing up. Um, I had, um, I had a troop of stuffed animals. So there was a polar bear who I think I just called bear. And then there was a, a little blue bear that I just called blue bear. And then there was uh, a stuffed Spider-Man who was like the leader of the group. Of and course, there was a, obviously. Of course, yeah. Wait, wait, yeah, me. He's well-trained. And then uh, there was a, uh, a giraffe as well, uh, a little, little giraffe. So those, like, up, like, I would stay up, like, till, like, four in the morning, like, doing different adventures, you know, and trying to not wake the parents up uh, with that. Um, but wait, you asked as well, like, where I came up with this. Yeah, where, yeah. where, did, where, did, where did that come from? Like, I mean, yeah. I've, been, I've been wanting to do a story with those characters um, for a long time. Um, and I, and I wanted to do something that was for a younger audience and just had a more straightforward adventure that was, you know, with, with these, with these kind of, and there's just been so many different things out there, there where people have been experimenting with this kind of thing there has been toy story. There's that amazing internet meme that has like a little teddy bear fighting a dragon. You may have seen yes, that. I've seen that. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, they just things like that. I think we're, we're, as I always wanted to write about these characters I, I grew up with, the, the, um, you know, th that those other influences were kind of accumul accumulating in my mind. And then I'm like, all right, let's finally sit down and, and do this. So I think that's, it was like a buildup of several things. Nice. Uh, I loved, I loved how dark it was. Like, you know, so often when you read stories about toys come to life, it's a little more whimsical and like, you feel like the danger isn't really present, but in your story, it was so creepy like that the monster was just terrifying. Like, yeah. I loved, I just loved how, and also just even the real life struggles that the family was going through and like Loretta and like, it was very, I liked how it sort of touched on sort of almost a real life fear of like, you know, when, not that I've ever experienced losing a friend that way, but like the feeling of loss and, you know, all those themes was, I really liked how you handled that in conjunction with the fantasy elements. Yeah, yeah. thank you, I appreciate Yeah, and I, I have a feeling based on our, what I'm assuming our ages are and, um, and, and what we have all written and created, I'm assuming um, there was some influence of a lot of uh, 80s uh, and science fiction and like Tim Burton kind yeah. of stuff in there, <laughs> Edward Gorey kind of stuff in there. Um, just that whole era of like the sci-fi comedies where like they're completely Im implausible, almost Lovecraftian things are happening and yet, <laughs> And yet the characters are like fun and you want to hang out with them. Yeah. Like, like, like a Ghostbusters kind of thing. I feel For like sure. I have a feeling all <laughs> of us have, have dipped, have been influenced by that. I hope that's a safe assumption. Yeah. I don't want Absolutely. To... Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we all have similar references, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's definitely, I mean, the Edward Gorey thing is real, very strong. I feel like, I feel like also the, the Tim Burton stuff is definitely there. Um, 
the Edward Gorey stuff, I, I got I got kind of shown Edward Gorey's artwork very, very early on when I was a kid by my, my grandfather, like wait, probably too early for my, for my childhood. And it was a little scarring, but, um, but it definitely, you know, stayed in my mind. So that was part of the kind of engraving, kind of that obsessive line work kind of quality that Warren has in the same series. So, yeah. 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 And I, I think, I think what our two books have in common is that the main character is, you know, the stuff that you would hope a main character is like brave and, and you, you like this person, but uh, they're, they've been saddled with this, this huge burden that's been handed down from generations. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and there's a relentless optimism that keeps them going <laughs> um, through the slog of that. You know what I mean? It's, it's not, you know, they're willing to do the things like, um, like the dirty work and, and Warren literally does the dirty work sometimes, but like right. relentlessly optimistic the whole time. And like, you know, I, I often ask people and I try to ask myself, like, does, does the character you're yep. writing, do they actually <laughs> like their job? Sorry, I'm going to mute myself real quick. <laughs> There's an attack. Um, yeah. No, d does the character you're writing actually like their job? It's, it's amazing. There are a lot of people who write books and they, and they, they don't answer that question for themselves. But I think, I think Warren and Spark like their jobs. Yeah, that, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's a very good comparison. I think there's definitely parallels there. Um, and, and speaking of Sparks, Robert, I, I have to be honest with you, no spoilers, because I'm only about halfway, halfway through right now with Sparks, so I need, I need to finish it up. But, but I have really been enjoying it. Um, I think so far, I think Zed, Zed may be my favorite character so far. Okay. <laughs> I'm sort of a sucker for oh. Zed. Yeah, I forgot. That, there was a sock monkey in my group, too. I can't believe I just forgot oh. about it. Yes, yes. Yeah, Zed, nice. Zed's a good time. Zed's a... Uh, Hopefully Zed will rise to the occasion, but you'll, you'll find out. Yeah. yeah. But, and I should and I say, to, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I've read, I've read book one of, of the Warren series. So I'm, okay. I'm catching up slowly, but I, but I definitely, I've completed that. I, I got to the big event in, in Warren yeah. the 13th, which was incredibly satisfying. Um, okay, cool. But go ahead. You were saying. Oh, no, no. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for not spoiling it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, I was going to say, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of echo what Tanya was saying, that the monster is awesome and scary and terrifying in, in Spark. I mean, it really was cool. It's one of those things where, like, reading this description, I was like, I want to draw this creature. Like, this is so cool. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a great read so far, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I, I had a quick, I had some questions for you as well. Um, have you seen a bear in real life ever in the <laughs> woods, anywhere Perhaps a zoo, I suppose, is the easiest spot. But I, I've only seen them at zoos, and probably the bears I've seen the most are the polar bears they have at different zoos. I, I am quite certain I have never seen a bear in the wild. Uh, I didn't live that far outside of Philadelphia growing up, and so I just wasn't. I mean, there are some bears in Pennsylvania, not not very many. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I never. City. Not too many in New York these days. Yeah. <laughs> Although that might be changing, I hear, because of because of the lack of activity. I hear that the wildlife and the fauna are uh, retaking some things, so there might be some interesting things coming up. Um, That's true. I have seen deer in my neighborhood where I grew up, but no, not bears. Okay. Because I have I do have a bear story if you want it. If you want. I would to love to hear it. it. Okay. So I was uh, when I was I was driving from California up to Seattle, and I was going on the freeway. And I was going through the Avenue of the Giants, which is that where they have all the giant tall redwood trees, basically. And there's all these hairpin turns in that area. And I was driving, I thought, relatively quick and you know, fairly fast. But the people behind me did not seem very happy that I was driving the way I was driving. Like They were like obviously locals and wanted me to go faster. So I'm like being careful and driving through. And then when, when I get through the hairpin turns of the Avenue of the Giants, we get to, I get to this sort of the freeway. And I... I put my foot on the pedal and just kind of zoom off to get away from these people that are kind of, you know, pressuring me to drive faster. And right as I gear up and I'm going probably 80 miles an hour in my small little black car, I see on the left side of my eye, a giant black bear starts sprinting across the freeway. Yee. Full, full speed. They're and so it, fast. It's terrifying. And it was the most majestic and like, terrifying moment of my life like I was I was sitting there with my, my jaws like on the you know on the steering wheel basically and I'm just like staring at it. you're watching I'm watching this bear like gallop in slow motion and I'm also trying to steer the car so I don't hit this bear basically uh it was amazing and terrifying and uh yeah so that's my bear story well, and then I had white I had white knuckles for about like a week afterwards I, I was just like <laughs> being so, so terrified I have white knuckles now <laughs> 
Jeez. So, not a teddy wow. bear, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm trying to actually in the manuscript I'm working on now. I'm trying to throw in some material where the the teddy bears imagine themselves as uh, as like grizzlies and like real. Yeah, so that like I think there's some like teddy bear artwork in my in this new book where the the teddy bears like almost like uh, you know cave art or whatever. They're drawing pictures oh, of cool. their of their legends, but of course they make themselves look like you know the bear from from uh, Golden Compass, like a warrior bear with like. A, you yeah. know suit of that. armor fighting people and i'm like <laughs> so it's you know that's everybody builds their yeah. own myths i guess even the bears have myths of course. yeah uh, it, yeah it they're, is, they're great yeah. it is nice that you're able to balance at least you know as, as far as i've read so far balance like some of the darker elements with these moments of levity and and, and humor and stuff and, and i think that's been a nice it's a nice balance as well for the, for the novel so cool yeah. um i oh go ahead you, did you have another one no no I have to I have to torch you guys with a question um, <laughs> that might get all of us in trouble. I don't know. Um, <laughs> is Aunt Anaconda, who's the villain of the first book, is she based on someone you know? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I didn't create her. Will did, so he's. Gonna that. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay. Passing the buck. <laughs> um, yeah, she was actually part of the original um, character creation back in art school. So I did a lineup of characters. It was Warren, it was Rupert, it was Anna, and then there was um, a part-time butler character that I designed that we that I cut out that then just became Warren. Full -time. He did all the jobs, I think. Um, but yeah, so she was part of the original um, original kind of creation and pitch. I don't think she was based on anyone in particular. I think it's just that typical evil stepmother kind of archetype, I think that is more the, 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 you know, creation part of it, but. Yeah, you get the impression that she, she's been saddled with the same kind of responsibilities as Warren, but instead of meeting it optimistically and with joy, she's at the point in her life where she's like, she hasn't gotten what she wanted out of her life. So now she's gonna just steamroll everybody else and get the all seeing eye and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that was, yeah. maybe I relate to that too much. I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> well, writing her, I definitely pulled from um, The Witches with by Roald yeah. Dahl. Like, mm -hmm. that book scared living daylights out of me when I was a kid. And then the movie came out, and that was even more terrifying. But that the head witch in that book is so creepy, and she's so manipulative, and I kind of love that. So I kind of yeah. wanted to bring that into Anaconda's personality, the sort of ode to the OG. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that book is dark. Yeah, that is. That yeah. Has some, yeah. mm. <laughs> in fact, I read that, I actually read that in preparation for what I was writing. Because I realized, oh, okay. I don't know if you had the same issue, but I mean, I realized that I was just not well read in this genre. Mm. And, uh, and I read some real, like, I had never read Charlotte's Web. Oh, I had wow, never read, did. yeah, I'm embarrassed to say that. No, but, no, uh, no, it's no, no shame, no shame. Yeah, I had never read, um, like Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. I had never, like there was a bunch of stuff that I, I had not read until well into adulthood. Yeah. I really needed to catch up on things. But what, but you know, the interesting thing is, and I'm sure writing comic books, you, you know this, like there, there's a discipline that is required to write something like this. Cause you can't just go off on tangents. Mm -hmm. You can't have the characters sitting on a beach contemplating <laughs> their life. You need them right. to actually keep doing stuff. And there's a, and I think a lot of people who don't write that much, like they'll see, they'll look at a book that's like the size of a brick and they'll be like, wow, that looks, and, and certainly there's a lot of effort that goes into that. But I think like you have to really discipline yourself to write something that's like as thin, you know what I mean? Like this, yeah, this no, it's that was like the thing about editing. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to yeah. do that. It's hard not to go on tangents. And I think, for sure. yeah, that <laughs> it took a while for me to, I think I was, most of the work that I write usually has to get cut in half by the time <laughs> it's, you know, but that's just, I mean, I've had, I've had people yell at me, like, you don't have to give everything a backstory. You don't have to give his jacket yeah. a backstory. You don't have to, like, <laughs> he just owns a jacket. Move forward. That's it. Yeah. Well, I feel like yeah. with book two, I definitely feel like that book, I kind of went a little bit off the rails with the, with the draft. It was twice as long, I think, as it is now. And I remember that was a battle in the editing room as far as, like, reminding myself that this is a book for kids and they're not going to sit through a, you know, yeah. 400 Ton page tome. <laughs> Tanya was just trying to trying to trying to you know kill me on that one because she was like <laughs> first of all I have to do twice as many illustrations and also try to cram twice as much as many words in the same amount of pages basically yeah. so it's a yeah
and, That's your and, need. We're, and were the illustrations like, you know, she, you were you writing like philosophical debates and stuff, but <laughs> then you had to illustrate that will and there's no way to make that look cool? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> no, it was, we, uh, we, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's worked out really good, actually. It's, it's, you know, obviously the way the, the book is laid out, it is sort of an atypical setup for these kind of books where generally when you have an illustrated book, um, the author and the illustrator are working parallel paths. Right. But the way that the Warren books are laid out is a little bit trickier because um, the, the, the layouts are not really fluid. So I have to wait for final copy editing text to come in so I can actually flow that in and then drop in the basically the placeholders where, where the art's going to go. So right. we can't really work you know, simultaneously. We can't really you know, um, expedite the process. It's sort of a it's sort of a two-step process, which is also why it takes a little bit longer for the books to come out between each volume. So. Okay. But, yeah. I still think three books in five years is, I don't know, <laughs> Kelsey, Kelsey's like, no, I need them faster. Uh, <laughs> Even the Warren books are worth the wait. I mean, yes. everyone next to me too. I mean, can't, can't rush this. This is beautiful. It, 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 it really is. It re it's, it's real. like, cause when I heard, saw it was illustrated, I was like, yeah, okay. There are pictures that go, but it's, it's more than just pictures. I mean, it's, you know, like there was one image of, of like Warren climbing on a ladder alongside the text. So it's almost yeah. like he was climbing the page. It, yeah. it's just really creative stuff. It's yeah. really cool. Well, and it's also been fun because we've realized it's actually, it's, it's struck a chord with some reluctant readers, I feel like. People that, kids that don't really, you know, that are intimidated by large books that are all text. So I feel like the kind of spot illustrations throughout help, help kind of guide them and make them feel confident they can finish this book and not, you know, be overwhelmed with just a, a book of words, you know, um, which is, it's unfortunate that some kids feel that way, but I'm glad that, it found Warren and, and you know it solves that problem so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh, like was the series plotted plotted out or were you kind of just making up each story I don't know um, yeah I find like I my second book was not originally <laughs> as well planned as my first I will admit yes don't I think it's earmuffs to, Kelsey earmuffs <laughs> <laughs> I think it's safe to, I think it's safe to say that as well we uh I think we had um, a, a big plan for the first book and then some loose plans for following books. Um, um, but I think it would have been better had those loose plans for book two and three been a little bit more solid. Yeah, we, yeah. we struggled, and now especially book two with the outline, like we had an idea of where we wanted to take it as far as the different places Warren can go within the confines of his hotel. Um, and But then once we actually sat down and had to like outline it, it was really hard to like, nail down the story and also leave it open for the third book and with the third book we had to wrap things up but also it was important that each book can be kind of read standalone yeah so that is so hard of, yeah so yeah. There a lot of things that kind of went into it that were very tricky so yeah outlining is not my favorite is that, yeah <laughs> it's, yeah I'll, i feel like that there's that meme going around of, of one of the characters from i think uh it's always sunny in Philadelphia, like standing in front of a big board going like, like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's me sometimes when I'm outlining. Yeah. 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 Although it is nice when you do have the finished outline, it makes the writing so much easier, I think. Like, you know, you have a roadmap to follow. You know, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, you know, I find that even when writing, I do still find surprising tangents popping up or little side quests I didn't quite outline initially and will always like gets frustrated i know in the past when i was like well i added this whole section that wasn't there in the outline but i don't know if that happened with you robert when you're writing if suddenly you deviated from the outline because you got inspired in the moment while writing you, you know usually i deviate them from the outline because i realize there's something in the outline that doesn't work mm -hmm. so i wish it was a creative thing uh it <laughs> happens sometimes it happens sometimes um yeah there's definitely because my story has a challenge because the you have the teddy bears and their adventure, but also the children and their adventure, and they don't really interact because that's because the, the rules of this world are that the teddy bears are not just going to talk to the humans. Yeah. So, but everything's from one of the teddy bears' perspective. So she has to be there to see the humans do stuff. Right. So that ends up being a huge challenge because I can't just, I, I, you know, I was running out of excuses to have the teddy bear follow her along. This uh -huh. is like a, an 11 year old girl. So she's not carrying her teddy bear everywhere she goes anymore. Yeah. So I, you know, there was a lot of scenes right to come up like, okay, well, why is the teddy bear here now? Uh, so th that ended up um, causing a lot of deviations from, from the thing as well. But there were some, like I, I, I decided to have a scene where in the second book where the, the teddy bears 
hijack a vehicle. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm clearly just having, I'm doing this. We're doing it. Why not? Um, I feel like that's another 80s kids movies For thing. Sure. A bunch of movies yeah. from the 80s, like Daryl and some others where a kid <laughs> drives a car. And I'm like, yeah. I could do that. I don't care that's, if I'm nine years old. I could do that. That's the dream. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is like, it's like, it's like Heat starring teddy bear or something. Some kind of like bank robbery. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you guys use for, for writing? Is it just Microsoft Word or do you have other, other tools that you use for writing? Are you guys, are you note card people? What is the process for outlining and, and writing for both of you? I use Word uh, for pretty much everything. Um, okay. But I also carry a notebook on me and if, if ideas come to mind, usually when I'm on the subway or something, I will write them and then add them to the, to the manuscript later. What I end up doing is um, as the novel grows, uh, at the end of the novel will be a list of notes that of things I have to change things I have to add um, So even if I'm having a day where I don't know where to go next I can always go to those notes mm. and it's like, okay, there's just like three lines I have to add just to establish like some Some device that might get used later on, you know, like uh, uh, Like in Ghostbusters where they say uh, you know, don't cross the streams Then of course at the end of the movie they cross the streams to, to beat right. the bad guy So I've been especially as I get toward the end of the book I've been finding I have to do add a lot of those things. So mm. the longer the manuscript gets, the more of those notes I have. So I always have something to do, even mm. on days when I'm not feeling particularly energetic or creative. That's smart. Yeah. I like that. I'm gonna steal Thank that. <laughs> yes, yeah, everyone yeah, should steal I that. will, yeah. Um, I yeah. use Scrivener for drafting, which is a relatively new thing. I started with book two on using Scrivener. Um, I really like it because it has a kind of a note card built like function built in and mm -hmm. like a bulletin board where you can rearrange note cards basically in a sort of virtual way. Um, but I have to finish everything in word because that's the only one that actually makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. But I also keep notes in a like handwritten notes, like outlining is usually done by hand. I think that helps it's a different brain process. So the, mm -hmm. the handwriting aspect of that kind of unlocks the, the gunk that needs to be gunked out for the outline. And then once I have that set, then I can start typing. Mm -hmm. Now, Will. So, oh, sorry. Do, what? Do either of you have a, do, I mean, Will, do you have a favorite thing that you drew? And, and Tanya, do you have a favorite section that you wrote? Like, and this is just favorite, not necessarily the one you're proudest <laughs> of, which I think is a different thing. Or the, or the best thing you wrote. That's the, the, the thing you had the most fun maybe writing or drawing. I'll let Will answer that while I think about my answer. Yeah, I'm trying to think as well. I'm like, we have three volumes of books to pick from now. And I'm trying to go back in time and think about these. Um, I, um, I will say my least favorite thing to do um, first. Let's do that. Let's start with that. Um, sure. Uh, I'm sure there's some crowd scenes somewhere that I'm not happy about doing. But, uh, I, but the, the most challenging thing, which is quite ironic because my, in my, my day job is I'm a book cover designer, is the most challenging thing was doing actual book cover design for Warren the 13th. It was like trying to figure out the look for the first book was um, really challenging. And I have like 25 unused cover designs that we didn't end up using for that, um, you know, for all for various good reasons. But it was really hard. I think because I was so close to the material, it was really challenging trying to find a way to package this and make sure it kind of, you know, worked on a bunch of different levels. Um, as far as my favorite thing, I guess, in the, in the newest book, in the third book, um, War on the 13th, The 13 Year Curse, available now, um, there is um, a, an extended scene where Warren um, goes underwater, under, you know, underwater in sort of a scuba suit. Um, and that was quite fun, because just because the landscape and the um, elements are so different from everything else in the other rest of the series. Um, and he meets a very boring, talking clam who I was not <laughs> thrilled about trying to design initially. Um, but it, I think it turned out great. And it's one of those things where sometimes you don't, uh, you don't think it's going to work and it just clicks and you go, fantastic. This is, this looks good. So those are probably my, that's my, that's my least and favorite parts of, uh, of the books, I suppose, design wise. Cool. Cool. Okay. Tanya or Robert? For me, well, for, for my least favorite is writing any of the puzzles. Cause I hate, I hate creating puzzles. <laughs> I've complained about this in like every interview I've done, which yeah. I feel bad so yeah. many puzzles are in this book and all three books, but like. Why like, you agreed to a book of mysteries, I don't know I don't why. Know. But I yeah. don't know, you know, I'm, I just, I'm bad at solving puzzles and I'm bad at creating them, but you know, it was a process. But my favorite 
it's hard to pick a favorite scene, but my favorite character is like Captain Grayish Whitish Beard. Yeah. I just love his like refusal to admit he's a pirate. And so anytime I get to write a scene with him where he declares that he's an importer exporter, but mostly exporter, I love that. Like he's just, he's my favorite. So that's probably, you know, and I, I do apologize to Will because I would always write crazy scenes, not really thinking about how it was his job to illustrate them. And so I would just kind of go off in my mind, like this would be really epic if I did this like crazy battle with like 50 characters and, you know, chaos and, I think every, I think the second and third book had a lot of scenes like that with the uh, multiple mm -hmm. characters battling. And well, and to, and to be fair, Tanya, though, it is a, a situation where it's sort of like, it's doing the sequel, doing the trilogy. It's, it's like you have to amp up the stakes yeah, a little bit, so it's, it's more true. epic. So I understand that there's also that kind of logic to it, so, yeah. Yes, the rule of right. sequels. Yes, <laughs> bigger. Sad, sadly, bigger, yeah. 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 So um, Robert, what, what are your favorite scenes that were least favorite parts of your, your book? Well, I guess least favorite for me, especially in the, the sequel I'm working on now, is um, would just be the scenes where I'm obligated to have a large number of characters who are just, who are just talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to keep those to a minimum because they can get boring and static very quickly. But I've found that I've, I've written some of those just because I want to get, bring some of the more of the characters in so they can be more involved and that each of them could have their own little arc. The problem is that sometimes I'll finish those scenes and then I'll look back and look, look, at, look back and read it again and be like, oh, so-and-so didn't have a single line that whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, those are frustrating. Um, I've, uh, but again, I've tried to keep those few and far between. Uh, favorite scenes, you know, one of the big revisions with this book and it went through many uh, before it even got to Quirk uh, was uh, it, it involved the climax of the story. And I think the problem with the climax in the earlier drafts is that it didn't really... It was, it was the teddy bear doing all the work and not, um, and, and Loretta, who's the hu her human friend, uh, was not as involved as maybe she could have been. And it was mm -hmm. sort of a waste of that character. So when I finally, it took a long time and a lot of talking with my agent and with, and with my editor, but we, fi we finally figured out um, a way to integrate Loretta into the climax of the story in a very satisfying way that made mm -hmm. sense for the character. And once I did that, I was like, oh, all right, I think, I think we've gotten the climax right. Because I think, yeah, the original draft, I think, was just the teddy bears fighting the monster and they basically win. Yeah. But uh, this made it a little more complex. Trailer alert, yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now they lose, by the way, so it's a really depressing <laughs> book. <laughs> no, uh, uh, but, um, well, we don't know what happens. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, making getting the human characters a little more involved once I figured out, like, I, it's almost like I tuned the book to a certain frequency. Once I figured that out, then I was like, okay, now I, and then writing those scenes was much more satisfying. Cause I was like, okay, I'm really adding good elements to this, to this book that it really needed. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So oh. interesting. Um, we are out of time here. This oh. is really fascinating though. I know. I had more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we can uh, do something on Instagram or something. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you guys so much for talking to us about War in the 13th and Spark. And um, yeah, have a good weekend. It's thank good you. to end one and more. So. Yes, yes for so sure. Bye. Take care. Congrats, everybody.